Hey there, Dan Gastu here. Today's video is a summary of the full restoration of Renko and is proudly sponsored by MarineEngine.com. This whole series was about answering the question, is it a bad idea to buy an old steel boat? And I think by the end of it, we get the answer. But before then, let's go back to the beginning. In order to answer this question, I bought myself a copy of Metal Boat Maintenance and Repair by Scott Pratcher, and I thought we'd just read through the whole thing. Rescue a steel boat. Sweat equity goes a long way with steel boats. Sweat equity means you bought a boat cheap and you put in your labour to end up with a boat worth more than you paid for it. Having completely swallowed that absolute rubbish, I went down to Sydney, bought myself an old steel boat and brought it back up to the Hawkesbury. So here it is currently on Pedley's mooring in all its rusty glory. Well, welcome aboard. I'll tell you what I do know about the boat before we go and have a look around. So it's a nine meter vessel that was originally made out of steel. Now it's made out of rust. Uh, it's called Julie 2 T00. So that's a good clue to the fact that we'll be doing a video on whether it's bad luck or not to change the name of a boat. It's got a 471 uh, Detroit diesel GM motor in it, which is uh, a two stroke diesel. So I'll talk a bit about how they work down the track as well. Wheelhouse is pretty straightforward. Combined gear selector throttle, which is, you know, kind of nice and easy. Dials of which none of them work, but I have actually seen the taco working and I have seen, I think, oil pressure and and temperature working. So something's just happened. They've lost an earth or something. Uh, fuel gauge was never working. Voltmeter was working and switch panel. Came with a sonar, radar and GPS. I think the GPS has lost its uh, card for the maps. It gives a good position, speed, direction, all that kind of stuff, but no charts. And a working VHF radio and a stereo. Here under the helm, there's a fuse panel. So I'll go through, nothing's labeled there. So I'll try and figure out what everything is. Start mapping all the electrics, start labeling it. Nothing to really write home about, but a little sink here with a tap here. Don't know what that's connected to because we don't have a freshwater tank yet as far as I know. Here's a little gas stove and the gas bottle's outside where it should be. And then below here is just a little 12 volt fridge. No anchor winch or anything like that. So I'll probably look at adding something like that pretty soon. The other thing I do is I'm gonna cut some doors in these bulwarks. There's no doors at all. So nothing for the trance and nothing for the side. So it's actually quite a hard boat to get in and out of. So I'm definitely gonna just cut through, hinge one door, hinge another. Looks like the boat used to have a dry exhaust going straight up. Now it's got a wet exhaust going out through the transom. The engine, it's a General Motors diesel. I think the stern gland here is leaking, so it probably won't be a hard fix, but the bilge pump and the floats, which have both died. So in order to allow myself to sleep well tonight, I am gonna rush up to the workshop, grab a new float switch, grab a new bilge pump, and install that now. So you can see here the leaks definitely coming from the stern gland. I'm gonna tighten these three volts a little bit, see if we can slow that leak, but it's something I'll look at in more detail once we're on the hard stand. You know, it's kind of weird. When I bought a dirt cheap steel boat, I kind of thought it'd be perfect, but it's not looking like it is. Here on the back of the wheelhouse, you can see they've installed some sort of seagull toilet. So I think I'll get the pressure washer out and start cleaning this up. So here and over here, were two tow posts on the boat or an A-frame, something along those lines. I think the previous owner cut these off and left the plates on. So I'm gonna get an angle grinder through the weld down at a bit of an angle and see if we can pry both these plates off the deck. With the starboard side, I originally started trying to cut down at an angle here just through the weld and it didn't seem to be working. I didn't really know how it was fully attached. So in the end, I cut a square pulled the center section out. Here it is, you can see it's about 10 mil thick. And then we were able to get a bar and because I'd already done some cuts in these welds, I was able to break these bits off reasonably well, except for this bit, which I need to cut again. Over here on the port side though, this time I'm just gonna sort of have faith that there is nothing under here at all in the way. And I'm just gonna keep cutting through this weld until I can get a cold chisel underneath it and just lift the whole plate off in one piece.
Over here, I think there was some sort of stainless fitting coming through the deck, which has obviously reacted badly with the mild steel. So I'm going to have to cut this out and weld a new plate in. You can see, hopefully, it's actually gone through here too, which is where the, uh, the engine cover is. So we'll have to have a look at how well we can repair that as well. So this video kicks off with me taking the boat upstream towards the marina and finally seeing what it looks like under the waterline. Unfortunately, it also happens to be during a bit of a record-breaking heat wave, so it was one of those days. It's 35 today, it's going to be scorching hot standing on an asphalt hard stand under a steel boat, not a steel boat. So about the worst of it is that the anodes have been eaten away completely and there's a hole through the keel where the anode strap is closest to the mild steel. About the only thing that probably be worse than the anodes being completely gone is being not gone at all because they weren't well connected to the hull. So that's something, at least they did their job. Uh, the hull itself doesn't look too bad. There's a few dodgy spots, but by and large, it actually looks all right, which is good. Didn't even have to undo the last bolt, it's so corroded the flange at the top. So you can see the flange for this rudder post and the shaft here is really eaten away. The metal of the hull around it doesn't look too bad, which is good. I'm going to have a go at using electrolysis to clean this up, so we'll do those in a separate bid. But for now, I'm going to duck down to the local oyster farm and have a chat to them and see about finding a space to put this for a month or so. Had a few beers with the guys. That's where all business is done. And sounds like we've got a place we can put the boat, which is great. So this is the space that Rob has said I can use to work on the boat. We'll have to get it up here on a really high tide, about a 2.1 next week, which is about as high as it gets, so that should be good. And then we can just drive a crane down here and uh, lift it out, put it on acropops and push on. So everything else is organized now. My only real last concern now is the depth of water here, but We'll find out in two days time. I think it's a 0.6 at the moment, so hard to judge, but I'd say it's probably gonna take like a 0.9 or something to cover here. So we're only gonna have a bit over a meter of water. Sitting here by the water now, waiting for Dave to pick me up. Good chance to uh, contemplate my poor life decisions, but you know how it goes. Come on Eddie, you can cheer me up. Oh, oh what's happening oh, buddy? It's just, Dave, drop them. What's happening, buddy? Sight so sore eyes you are already. So now we have the bit I'm most nervous about getting into that really shallow section to get this lifted out. That went a lot better than I thought it would. We're right up to the seawall, and the water's not even up the top of the seawall, so it's all right. Crane's here, don't know where the driver is. Now the boat's safely on its new hard stand, I need to make some of my own props for the boat so that I can give those ones back to Femex Marina. I may as well use this original base from the Acroprop, so I'll need to cut that off later. Uh, but I'm going to do both cuts at an angle now, then I'll set the saw square again so I can cut these off.
Because I need to tie the two sloping stands together with a chain to tension them, I've ground a curve onto a D-shackle and then I'm going to weld that onto the stand. All right, so they're fitting really well. I'll go over and give you a closer look and then we'll tighten up the turnbuckle. So sitting nicely and then the angled head here is nice for the hull. What I was also told is because of the way the hull shapes, they actually bias them slightly inwards so that they're heading towards the section of the hull that's actually getting tighter instead of having them going outwards where they could slip forward like that. Last week we looked at how stuck this rudder post is. Now because at an absolute minimum I'm going to be replacing the rudder post, maybe even the whole tube as a few people suggested, just cut it out, start again, which is on the cards. But before I you know, go to that extreme, I am going to cut this rudder post lower, which will allow me to get the yoke off, which will then allow me to put a bit of a collar around here and we'll get our ATF and acetone mix in here. There we go, sleeve on hose clamp tight around it and plenty of space here now to fill with oil acetone and let it gravity feed down. All right, time to mix up the holy trinity of ATF coopers and acetone, then we'll pour it into that sleeve. All right, it's pretty full. I'm just gonna let that sit for a day or two. To get around this problem not having 15 amp power yet, I went down to Bunnings and bought one of these little 10 amp welders. I don't think it's gonna be great for doing big jobs, but it's certainly gonna be handy for doing bits and pieces. The other thing about this is it's nice and small, so it can fit in your handbag in case you break a nail. Obviously, I'm gonna to have to cut the stuck welding rod off before it's ready to hammer in, but other than that, good to go. The part the end of the, yeah. the wipe is the hottest part. That's yep. the way where you see it's not hissing too much. Yeah, gotcha. But when you're cutting, you do less air. Oh, okay. We've got time to heat set up here. Yeah. It's not just in the boat, so... No. Got it. Hey! Well done. Jeffo! Hey! <laughs> <laughs> Here, just above the bright orange rusty hull, is the propeller shaft. Not a lot of space between the stuffing box and the flange that attaches the prop shaft to the gearbox. But these here are the bolts I'm going to get off first. So this is all the space I'm definitely going to get between the gearbox and the end of the prop shaft because this flange is now hard against the stuffing box, so that's all I'm going to get. So I'll take this screw out first and unfortunately the face spanner I've got is at home. I'm thinking an air chisel into one of these holes is my best bet. If I have to get a new nut, you know, so be it. Well, that was surprisingly easy too. I'm gonna to take a little break from that prop shaft. I think to get the flange off, what I'm gonna do is put a spacer between the flange and the gearbox to lock it, then get some long bolts and go through both flanges, tighten the nuts and try and pull it off that way. In the meantime, I decide just to get on with cutting the rest of the strip off the chine of the boat, but that didn't go so well either. Oops, I was cutting more of this plate off, quite thin, but I think the cut this way went a bit too far. And that's actually diesel running out now from this starboard fuel tank. The upside to this little disaster is that the fuel light came on in my truck today and I don't have any money to buy diesel, so I'm just gonna put it straight in the truck. On the bright side though, with this leaking fuel, I did hit on a bit of a technique that works pretty well and is reasonably quick, which is doing shallower cuts with the angle grinder and then getting in behind the strip with the air chisel. So that meant that I didn't have to cut as deep and risk cutting through the hull and I could still get it off pretty quickly without putting too much effort in. So I'm pretty happy with this technique and I now have all of the rubbing strip off below the doublers. The only remaining bit is the little bit on the bow forward of the doublers. All right, next thing I do is just take the awning off so we can get the crane in.
Rob's on his way down now with the crane. My only real fear is that it gets hung up on the mounting bolt somehow when we end up lifting the boat off the stand, so that's what I'll be keeping an eye out for the most, and then we'll settle it on the ground on some blocks. Ed, pretty manky. So, lots of slime, bit of oily water and coolant down the lowest point. So we'll jump in and we'll have a look. My biggest concern initially was actually this section where the salt water was just dripping down onto the metal for probably decades. So I'm going to get my ultrasonic thickness tester and measure what's shaped the hulls in here. Hopefully it's not too too bad. As a bit of a quick tip while we're doing this, often if I don't have one of those sort of plastic balers, I'll get an old milk bottle or a juice bottle like this, two litre one, and just cut the base at a bit of an angle. Then you've got the handle here, leave the lid on, and they actually make really good balers. What I like about them with tinnies in particular is because it's quite a soft plastic, it'll sort of shape itself around the hull that you're scooping and you can get quite a lot of water out with one of these. What I'll do too is leave a tiny lip on the bottom here so you can kind of scoop in with it and not have it run out so much. So we'll go use this to get the last bit out. So. A bit of cheap effective recycling. While I was waiting for it to dry, I moved on to getting the flange off the end of the prop shaft so I can remove it. And to do that, I started by just spraying it with a bit of penetrating oil. Then I put a puller on it and loaded that up with the impact gun so I had a bit of tension on it, then started to heat it. As it was cooling then, I gave it a couple of smacks with the hammer and it popped forward a fair bit. So I think we're home and hosed. Well, I'm glad that coupling came off. I needed a win today. First thing this morning, I uh, went to finish the door and the welder had died, so I drove an hour or so up the coast to drop that off at a repair guy who wasn't there. Anyway, cheers. I'm going to have a Bundy to celebrate Project Brewpig. I'm going to put the puller on the stuffing box. It's either going to pull the stuffing box out or more likely push the prop shaft out, but we want to do both, so... Either way, it's a win. All right, I think I might work on getting the prop shaft all the way out, because I think that's going to make it freer to get the stuffing box out anyway. Yeah. That wasn't hard. And we cleared the ground. The day's picking up. So you can see here, this nut's been welded around here. So we're gonna have to do some grinding here. Get that off, then pull the prop off with a puller. Is it a good idea to buy an old steel boat? Sure, sure. Not actually sure this has budged a millimetre yet. Should have marked it. Feels like it's really coming now. Uh, got it. Uh, Alright. This is what we're left with. 
this here is supposed to be the stuffing that compresses and uh, stops the leak but it's obviously just old and hard and there. just winds in till you've got a bite on it and then pull on the T-piece all right looks like it's all out now this is as low as I can get to the deck unfortunately so now just a bit of grinding to get this flush whole section out which is 600 mil long and I'm going to cut it out to the exact height of the bit of plate I've got to go in Finally got my little stack of discs for doing the repairs. Turned out they were already here, they'd actually just gone to the workshop rather than to the island. What I'm going to do is put them in from the outside, just put my magnets across here to hold them in position, then weld them out on the inside first. Then I can come outside, grind any sputter off and weld the outside. The advantage to doing the inside first is that you're doing your grinding on the outside rather than the inside, so it makes things a bit cleaner. Step one though, before welding this kind of thing in, is to try and psych the boat out. It makes the job go much smoother. Alright, what I'm going to do now is pop one of our little discs in and just use these magnets to hold it in place. Here he comes, getting exciting. Luke, how are you mate? Hi. So Luke's about to head off. Sandblaster's hull actually looks pretty good few little spots but to be honest with you nothing you couldn't see before because the areas that are pitted are the areas where the paint wasn't wherever the paint was the steel's in great condition before the sun set that same day I got a coat of epoxy primer on so they didn't have any flash rust overnight then the next day I got stuck into opening the Detroit and seeing what we we're up against Ugh. Chunky. Yeah, I think this has all got to come apart. <laughs> Be surprised if those rings weren't seized on that one. Oh dear. Yeah, I don't know why it's got so much water in it. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Well, it wouldn't get in through here. You wouldn't think it would go through the gasket. Yeah, it's got the, got the breather, but that's too much for going through the breather, isn't it? Well, yeah, but I mean... Get the rocker assemblies off to get to these bolts, so... Undo these and we'll get it apart. Wound all the rockers off the push rods. Now I'm just undoing these bolts for the governor. Then I think we might be down to the main head bolts after that. Okay, undid two bolts at the bottom here. Four down here. And then there's a fork here that goes up to the governor. And actuates it in some way. I don't really know how it works, but it's now out of the way. Mm. It's not looking good, is it? Oh, and before I forget, this little engine disaster is going to cost quite a bit of cash, so I've put the Land Rover on carsales.com.au. If you want to buy it, go for it. Alright, let's get this little hatch off. Let us spray a little shifty bastard into it. See if it helps. Mm. 
when I put a bit of tension on the gearbox, pulling it with the truck, the whole block slides forward. So I've tied it off to a pile there. See how that goes. My money is on, it's still moving forward, falling off the blocks, knocking the stand, holding the boat, and the whole lot falling over. Put 10 on it. That went about as well as could be expected, but the boat didn't fall over. Gearbox is no further out. I'm starting to become of the opinion that corrosion is not your friend. Back from the hardware store now with a longer straight head crowbar so I can try a particular technique that I learnt during my apprenticeship. Doing this uh, reminds me when I was at my mate's house the other night for dinner and his daughter told me this joke. She's got to be, I don't know, 10, maybe less. And uh, she said, oh, why'd the chicken cross the road? To visit the crap mechanic. I was like, oh yeah? Then she said, uh, knock, knock. I go, who's there? She goes, it's the chicken. Oh, yeah, that was good for it. The surface rust and the crankshaft. Ed and I are going to cruise up my boat today. Just got back from Bundaberg and you know, easing into things. Have a little look at the other fishing fleet as we go past. Mostly uh, prawn and squid trawling around here. Got quite a few odd jobs to do today and what I really like to do, just as a bit of a morale boost, is get the prop shaft and the rudder back in. I feel like that'll be another bit of a milestone to feel like we're actually getting somewhere. What do you think Ed? You keen? tired at the moment. Here I've got the heat exchanger and the old wet exhaust sitting on these rubbing strakes and my ballast weight on the end. This has been sitting like this the whole time I was up in Bundaberg seeing Damien and Jess. So I'm going to get that off now, put it onto some saw horses, cut the ends and start oiling it ready to go back on the boat. You can see what a great lump of a pong box this boat had. Huge amount of internal space gone. 
it's not very often I am lost for words and I definitely am today you know uh, oh, I'm gonna burst into tears if I talk about it <laughs> it's terrible but this morning I cancelled the ad to sell the car and it's all because of you guys you know from people who donated on PayPal to became patrons on Patreon who bought a t-shirt you know even down to just words of encouragement saying look hang in there don't sell your car you know find another way and you guys found another way I didn't so I can't thank you enough I'm keeping the car I'm really happy about it and uh, uh, let's push on before I start crying <laughs> thank you to start painting the anti-foul on I've put some masking tape just say you know five mil maybe even less above the end of the polyurethane then I'm doing one more coat of the barrier coat then when that gets to the kind of thumbprint dry that Dave was talking about we'll come over and do our anti-foul over the top same day it's now been several hours since Vic and I put this coating on none of it's coming off onto my hand anymore it's actually probably a little bit too dry to even leave a thumbprint but it's only been a few hours so let's get in and put this anti-foul on it's funny there's something about uh fresh anti-foul that uh, always pleases people who live on the water you know you just see it and go right there's another year done i'm actually more excited about getting this anti-foul on than i was about the blue top sides the anti-foul i'm using is the altex number five plus which should be quite good in this area we do get a lot of barnacle growth around here so i think this will do the trick I got it in black. It is quite common to actually do like a lower coat of blue or something so that you know when you've worn through your top coats of anti-foul, but it was easy just to buy one big drum. First coat's done now, it's starting to get dark. I'm going home, I'll see you in the morning. Back in today, cleaning out the engine bay. Now the engine's off at CDA getting fixed. I may as well just start getting it ready so that by the time it returns, it's ready just to be dropped back in, save any further issues with how to store it and where to store it. So I'm just gonna run the cylinder hone through the stern tube, see if we can clean that up enough to get the stuffing box in. Already quite a bit better. All right, now I'll just give that a clean out with a bit of acetone. We'll put some phosphoric acid in there again, and then uh, we'll eventually, once the bay's painted, we'll get the prop shaft back in, do the packing, all that kind of stuff. Here I've bought two sticks of timber to replace the rubbing strips on the gunnels. The original ones are a little bit rotten on the ends, and have you know various bits of rot all along them and are covered in paint and would take quite a lot of work to get fixed up turns out these sticks are reasonably straight grain hardwood can't remember exactly what it was called sorry i should have remembered i'll find out uh they flex reasonably well and they were only 50 dollars each i mean i'd probably go through 50 dollars worth of sanding this trying to fix those up just gonna use the tap and die to clean all these threads out get the paint out then we'll start marking them up. Yeah. Can you drop it down a bit? I've got to duck off to the airport this morning because I'm heading up to Brisbane for the Sanctuary Cove boat show. But I'll quickly show you where we got to yesterday before we decided to eat oysters and do nothing. Got the new rubbing strip bolted on. My plan here is because I think there's the potential to walk along here, I'm actually gonna have the non-slip deck paint come all the way around here, so we'll be taping that up. I'm also gonna put a bead of Sikaflex along here. My plan is to oil these rather than paint them, because I think a little bit of natural timber 
you know, it sort of looks nice on a steel boat, breaks it up a little bit. Heading up to Hornsby now just to buy a few things for the boat. It's funny, you watch Eddie Lee in every corner. You'd be a good surfer, Eddie. Lean. Oh, left hander. Lean the other way. Lean. Nice work, Eddie. <laughs> Ed, what are you doing? Mate. No. Look at you. Look at the state of you. Oh, you're dreaming. Don't get too close. Oh, you're an idiot. You, my friend, are a world-class idiot. Don't look so pleased with yourself. Despite Eddie being there to boost my morale that day, it's certainly uh, fair to say there were times when motivation was low. Still on the bright side, it's not a bad day for the middle of winter. Can't complain. I can really, I can complain for my country, but I won't. So here I've welded that tab of steel across the hole and we just drill through the whole thing. All right, they're both out, finally. Sixty-three mil holes for the raymarine transducers. Done. It's times like this. It's kind of nice to think back to what this was originally, which was that huge uh, sort of pod for an old school transducer that was here, which was a nightmare to cut off. So from the pod being cut off to sandblast to epoxy to the new hole cut, I know it doesn't look like much, but. It was a lot of work and it's kind of nice to remind yourself in some ways. All right, this box contains the Real Vision Raymarine transducers that I need for this boat. Here they are. Ooh. I've gone the plastic ones, they come in different materials, but because it's a steel hull, I've got the plastic so it's not a dissimilar metal problem. Modern plastics though, are incredibly strong. Unfortunately, cheap plastic gives good plastic a bad name. Probably the most important thing is to make sure you've got the right transducer. So starboard side, all these double checks telling you this way goes forward, this way should be towards your keel, and it's starboard side. So you've basically got three things to help you make sure you're in the right place and you have it in the right orientation. Same on the the little anti-rotation bolt. All right, just going to do a bead around the bottom of the flange here, and then it looks like it talks about coming up the thread. So we're going to be winding the thread through, you know, around the sickerflex and using the sickerflex as a, a kind of a sealant and a bit of a Loctite, I guess. So I'll do that with two hands, and then we'll push this up in there. There's a little cap over the anti-rotation bolt. So I'll just pop that off. Another job I have to do before the boat goes back in the water is get the anodes on it. I've already got a couple on the rudder. I'm gonna try a few different ways of attaching them to the keel, see which way it goes best. Here, what I've done is drilled a hole through and taken some of the paint off the steel here so it's still pretty clean steel. Then what I'm gonna do is fill the hole and put some of this carbon grease, which is a conductive grease, behind the strap, bolt it up tight, and see how that goes. Next time I do a boat, and yes, there probably will be a next time, believe it or not, I'm uh, definitely gonna mount it higher on the stands. There isn't that much left to do on the boat now to get it floating again. I'm really keen to get it on the mooring. Uh, a few people commented they said it was a bad idea to get it on the mooring rather than finishing on the hard stand. Um, but I disagree, you know, I think it's going to be much nicer to work there. 
Uh, contrary to what people might think, I've actually thought about it. I've got a plan, I've got everything I need. You know, it's not just a spur of the moment decision without anything to back it up. So, to that end, I spoke to the crane company today. It'll make you laugh if it doesn't, it makes you cry. But it turns out that since I pulled the boat out of the water, all the cranes now have been chipped and they're not allowed to come across the bridge to the south or to the north of this town. So there's actually no way for a crane of that size to get to this boat anymore. Awesome, hey? Turns out all I can really do is get two small franner cranes that can cross the bridges, one to lift the front, one to lift the back, and then somehow coordinate it. it means it's gonna to have to go into the wall pretty close to the wall, parallel to the wall, won't be able to reach out very far. Is what it is. Anyway, so all I've got to do now is pick a date based on the tides, give them a heads up, and I'll lock that in. This bearing was a little bit loose, like not enough to fall out, but just a little bit loose. So I smeared some Sikaflex around the outside of it and then just slid it up and then we'll let that set. There we go, that's passed. That was just knocking the edge of the top bearing by the looks of it. This is moving pretty easily, which is good, but it means I'm gonna need to chock it up with something so it doesn't drop down while I run upstairs. I think that's a good height because it's lower than it needs to be but we can always lift it up from inside we can't drop it down with this in the way so we'll leave it there jump inside and put the yoke back on just rotating this rudder post until the key here is on the port side and then we put our yoke on we'll have the key there on the port side too I can't tell you how much better that steering feels now than when the original seized rudder and everything was in. It's awesome. It's certainly heavy. All right, we've hit a little snag. I've put a bit of lubricant on this, but it's getting really tight in this bearing. And I think the reason is, you can feel here where the shaft's worn. Presumably the bearing's been machined for this slightly narrower section and it gets, you know, a millimetre or so thicker here, which I think is more than enough to bind it up really tightly in the bearing. Just back now from BOC, picking up some dry ice pellets, so we'll give that a shot on the prop shaft. There we go. Got it suspended off the rudder post and it's full kind of top bottom sides so we'll let that sit for a while and see if we can get it in it's probably not the done thing but i really can't resist let's go to the shallows where there's nothing I'll probably get in trouble for that won't i never mind Lump of a thing. feels pretty good and that's out of the water the water will lubricate the bottom bearing a little bit while I think of it I sold the old Honda off the green machine and bought this little six horsepower tattoo four-stroke to put on the inflatable boat so I'll pull the inflatable out now and see if I can assemble that I'm 
going to tie the painter on now and something I do with these more permanent lines is do your usual sort of bowline on them. Then once you've done your bowline, normally you can actually come through the back, just come through the eye again, and then you get a kind of a double like this. That's how I like to leave them if they're permanent. I guess this is the official launching. Not very ceremonious, but uh, I think we should call this Red Dwarf. Sorry dudes, clearly upset the pelicans. I think it's fair to say this is the fastest it will ever go. O mighty and great ruler of the seas and oceans, to whom all ships and we who venture upon your vast domain are required to pay homage, implore you in your graciousness to take upon your records and recollection this worthy vessel hereafter for all time known as Renko. <laughs> Our chosen libation for Neptune, Poseidon, whatever. West week this time. It says half a bottle, but that's a waste. <laughs> now drink it. Drink it, Freddy, drink it. Fabulous. There you go. Half round. <laughs> I got all this lettering from Boat Names Australia. It's also where I got the information on the boat renaming ceremony from, so I'll put a link to that in the description. Pete gave me a hand this morning. We've cleaned the back deck up, and uh, Pete's taken off these two little lugs that were in the corners, nasty little trip hazards. Now we're just going to keep cleaning it find as many of these holes in the deck and just patch them, just patch them so I can go away for a month. Oh. We can always put a second layer in a couple of days time once that bottom layer is set. Oh, Not that you need to actually, that'll, that'll stay waterproof for four weeks for sure. Oh. Oh, sorry. It's now Sunday, uh, heading up to see Leon again to do some more work on the electrics. Friday's launch got canned due to the weather. We had really just two days of solid rain and the crane company wasn't keen to do it, fair enough. So I think we're gonna go for Monday. So today, hopefully, is officially our last sort of day working on the boat before it gets launched now. I think they're saying tomorrow morning. The morning tides are lower than the evening tides, but they're all pretty high at the moment. I know I can get off on the evening king tide, but there's a small chance if they launch it early in the morning tomorrow, which I think is the plan, that we might get off on the morning high. So I'll just see where it's at now. So we're actually just past the high, which is good. So if we'd got the peak, then tonight's tide is 1.7. Then tomorrow at 10.40, we've got a 1.5. This is Leon, who helped me do the board, Good. and uh, we're just having a look at it now. I might actually, Leon was just about to explain to me how a few things go, so I figure we may as well do that together. So what have we got? All right, so for the moment, the main thing we wanted to get going today was solar and builds, just yep. so that way you can leave the boat while you're away, yep. not be too concerned about it. Yeah, that really is, yeah, the goal for sure. So the way we've got these laid out is starting battery on the left, so that's 24 volt. Yep. Parallel switch between that and the house battery, which is on the right. Yep. And then this will be a 12 volt supply, so yep. each battery bank will go to those three. Yep. <coughs> the parallel is only in sort of emergency, I guess, because yep. you've got the auto switching yeah, reloader. Yeah, the VSR to <coughs> charge both batteries, yep, yep. both so, banks. So as soon as either solar is providing charge or yep. your engine's running providing charge, yep. this will kick in and feed power across this so side. So they're, they're paralleled whilst <coughs> ever there's a charge voltage on either side. Yep. We've also got feeding from that starting side down to the Red Arc DC to DC converter. Yes. So that will feed back up into your 12 volt system. So Perfect. Plenty yep. of current supply on that. Being 50 amp, that'll recharge your 12 volt pretty well. Even when you're using the winch heavily, it yep. should probably not Keep discharge much yep. at all. Now I'm just going to start trying to sort out some hoses for the bilge pump while I wait for Leon to get back from Jaker, and then we'll finish the electrics. I've mounted two bilge pumps to a piece of polyboard. Their wires are then just grouped with some cable ties into the three for each bilge pump. One is 12 volt, one is 24 volt. So they're gonna run off the two separate house banks. I really like this bilge pump hose because I think it's just all cast from the same material, but they've cast a kind of a spiral reinforcement through it. So it doesn't, you know, pinch off easily and stop water flowing, but the inside is completely smooth. So it lets the water flow really freely as well. So let's figure out how much we need of this and cut it and get it. <sighs> Pending any last minute phone calls, today is the day for launching. They're supposed to be here in about half an hour or something. I'm just packing up a few last things and I'm going to get some fenders out. The tide is out, as you can see. So they're going to be dropping it on the mud on some timber so they can pull the slings out. 
then I'm gonna have to tie it against the seawall so it doesn't topple over and just put some fenders out so it doesn't rub against the seawall and wait for the tide to come up. When it comes up, it's only gonna be a 1.5 predicted, which is not a lot, so um, we'll see. A little bit worried about that to be honest with you, but is what it is. Good news is they're here, bad news is they can only drop it in with the bow facing towards the camera here, which means I would need to pull the bow out over that lump of Eddy Island. Uh, and we've only got the 1.5 metre, and now we might have to pull it from the stern rather than the bow. Feeling less confident now. Could be sitting here for a month at this rate. Everything went really smoothly with the cranes. The guys were very professional, did an awesome job, very, very happy. You know, it was the weather that delayed the launch, it's not their fault. The real trouble with this delay is that I only had a 1.5 metre tide. I brought it in on almost a two metre tide, which is as high as the tide gets here. So, I mean, almost half a metre less. I think it probably wasn't quite at the top of the two metre tide when I brought it in, but definitely, definitely at least a foot lower than it was when I came in. Anyway, I've set myself up a little waiting station so I can wait here in my chair, see what happens. The cavalry's on the way though. Uh, Pete Bentley's gone back to his place to get some winching rigging gear. Uh, Rick, my mate with the Chief, is coming round. Unfortunately, the Chief's getting fixed at the moment, uh, finally. <laughs> so he's just coming round a tinny to help out. And then Dave Howell's coming round with Delstar to do the kind of main tow. So if we get it right on the peak, who knows? I think we'll get it out with enough determination. But, uh, it's certainly about a foot lower tide than I would hope for. Yeah. It's gone tight. That means it must actually be uh, floating a little bit. I'll loosen that off so it can come upright. What I'd really love to do is put a rope on the bow and pull the bow straight out and try and swing the boat around. I don't know. It's really shallow here just off Eddy Island and I I don't know if it's gonna work. I'm really loath to try and pull it out stern first because I've got the whole flat keel, the rudder in the mud. It's an enormous amount of force. So I don't know, we'll try both. I think I'll definitely try bow first. If that doesn't work, I'll try stern gently. If that doesn't work, it's gonna be here for a month. Yes, it's definitely looking a lot more level than it was before. So we know the water's starting to support the hull to some degree. And we're not at the top of the tide yet, so he's hoping. Pete's back with a bit of rigging gear. We're going to just experiment. I'll show you. There's some piles off here, which if we get down low around the concrete, we might be able to lift off. Obviously, we'll just keep a really good eye. If they start showing any signs of moving, we'll just abandon that plan. But, uh, you know, it's something we can winch off. That is a snatch. Right. So that's designed to have stretch and then this one, <coughs> right, winch extension strap. Yeah, so they're, they are different straps. So we could actually do a, like a snatch strap to Howley's trawler, get him to gun it, and then... Um, as crazy as it sounds... Yeah, all this is doing is pulling it over. What is it, another month? Pete's on turf for duty. We've got the uh, no, I'm starboard quarter no, tied off no, the Land no. Rover. The channel's very, very narrow. It's really the width of the boat. Anytime we went slightly out of the channel, the rudder would dig into the bank and we were just going nowhere until we then reset all the turfer, got it out, winched the boat back into the channel, 
got it going again. So it was a really tedious process of us all wading up to our waist in, you know, really muddy water. Lots of oyster cuts on our feet. Uh, you know, reefing on the lever for the turfer, just getting it, getting it, getting it. And eventually, at the end, when Delstar was able to pull it and it started moving, I thought, ah, oh, we've made it, you know. And, and that was the moment, but that was literally two hours of struggling, racing against the tide dropping again. So I left the camera running, but it's, you know, the battery went flat long before, it was a full battery, but it went flat long before the process was over because it was such a long process. Uh, it, it's just really hard to describe. And all I can say is how thankful I am to the people who came to help today. Pete bringing his gear, uh, Rick and Rob came down to help and it was awesome having a couple of other deckhands. They brought uh, their little boat, their little putt-putt down. We tried with that. Then Troy and Dave Howell came down with Delstar and they eventually helped us tow it to the mooring. Uh, my stepson Sam came down, gave us, you know, a hand where he could and some moral support. It was just like, without everyone being there, I, I wouldn't have got the boat floating, you know. So big thanks to all of you. Yeah, ease it up. Are you reckon, Siri? Yeah, I reckon we're good. I think it's just our way on, will help. Coming on. Just going neutral. Neutral. Stay neutral. Okay. On Dave. Good work. Thanks. Anything you want to say at this uh, momentous moment, Stu? Thank you for that. <laughs> the big rush to launch Renko on that terrible tide was because I was flying out to the US the following day to see Steve and Alex from Acorn to Arabella, Scott from Bus Grease Monkey, and Doug from SV Seeker. When I got back to Sydney, first job was to start installing the Raymarine sat-nav into Renko. I was thinking maybe over here would be good in the sense that you're between two windows a little bit, so you're not losing as much visibility, but it actually looks really odd, so I'm thinking up high. Alright, is it going to work for us? Ooh, that's exciting. Okay, English. Real English. Yes. Here's the map of Dangaronam. So the dial up here, I didn't realise at the time because I was kind of turning the edge, but the centre actually is a, you know, a dial you can turn in and out for different uh, settings. These are the maps I downloaded in a very similar way to when we installed the Raymarine on Delstar 2. Cool, happy with that. So sitting in 2.4 metres. It's pretty shallow here. Not tidal shallow, but just not, uh, you know, not super deep either. The next job was to get the Detroit diesel fired up before it went back into the boat and that's when a friend introduced me to Adrian and I met him for the first time. By the time Adrian had run the rack and set all the injector heights, etc., it wasn't blowing a wisp of smoke. He really uh, worked his magic on that engine, but sadly, not for the last time. Oh, mate's in Detroit. Why do you think I put the nappies in? In, we actually had to rejig it with a chain so that the gearbox dropped down a little bit. We were just a couple of centimetres short of fitting it in horizontal. Um, a little out and a little forward. So, there we go. It's in, finally. Well, ah, oh, not gratty over. So now what I'm going to do is just lift the front of the engine up and get the last two shims in. Then we're kind of good to go to start doing the fine alignment. First job of the day was to safely take the gantry crane down and then get on and start restoring the shut-off solenoid. This is the muffler, really tall and thin. You can see here and being a two-stroke diesel, you can go straight through.
All right, made it all the way to the end. And because I presume this end is going to be the hottest, being closest, I'll just wrap back. So we've got triple coating at this end. All right, just going to give this one a quick check. I'll flush it out actually. There we go, a bit cleaner. They're all flowing nicely. Okay, just measured the pipe length I need. I'll cut that on deck and then we'll come and install it. I'll wind these jack screws in until they're lightly contacting the base of the engine mounts. And then we'll just give them all four of them on this side. Number of turns, say like a quarter turn in to start with. Even with our better engine alignment, I could definitely still see a vibration where the gearbox was actually flexing on the mounting plate on the back of the engine. And, you know, obviously that's not ideal. It'll fatigue and cause all sorts of issues down the track. As a result, I gave my mate Mick at uh, Coast Marina call and he said, yeah, bring it round. We'll check it out for you. Next up, I had to fabricate an aluminium frame to be the new awning over the back deck. The idea with this frame is it's sized exactly to take six solar cells, so it's going to be our shelter from the sun and rain and uh, electricity generation. Sorry? You got a license for that thing? 41 knots. 40, 41? <laughs> what is the Evan Road? How many horsepower? 150. 150. Should have gone the 175. Yeah, I reckon it would have sunk it. <laughs> um, that is about there, Stu. Yep. Oh, all the way. Yeah, yeah. It is amazingly strong adhesive, though. Ah, beautiful afternoon. Sun shining off the water. Feel safe under their pedals? <laughs> I'm feeling very safe under there. So. Peggy was just noticing the sea chicken ate a catfish. Was it catfish with yeah. the barbs? Yeah. Wonder if just swallow spines and all, who knows? So far, so good. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> now, Eddie, what happened last time you sat on a boat like that? Do you remember? He's driving in. You getting dry? Yeah, we are doing a bit of... Oh! <laughs> that was close. Continue jousting. Could have chopped it off. You're doing well. Just in case there was a big gust of wind, you know, the last few days, I've had this tied off with rope so it can't flip up. But what I'm going to do now is put a final set of guy wires down to the top of the bulwarks here. Uh oh. Uh, that's annoying. All right. Feels pretty strong and stable now. I can hang off it, so that's a good start. So, time to stick a flex between them going this way so they don't drip and work out a ridge cap for going longitudinal. In the end, I think the awning worked out really well. It's been on the boat, I don't know, I guess a good 18 months now, been up and down the coast in pretty rough weather, so it's really secure, it doesn't move at all. Turns out that stays aren't just strong enough to uh, hold a mast and sails up, they're also strong enough to hold uh, an awning up. Who would have thunk it? Despite the joy of the new awning though, I had a little bit of an accident not long after this. Put my hands on the railing of that boat to give it a push. But because it was a really rough day, I had my hands on his railing and then, but I'd gone under the bow railing of Renko stupid um 
And then so when the railing of Renko came down, it hit the tops of my hands, but the bottoms of my hands were on the other railing and the two ra- like my hands were like that and the two railings essentially scissored through both my hands. I put my workbench in the autoclave this morning, so it should be good to go. This was a blister actually. I didn't know this, but apparently when you have breaks, it's quite common to have a blister near a break. Just give it a bit of saline to clean it off. You can see there, they've pretty much opened it up the length of that bone. But it's healing pretty well. I think these are dissolvable stitches. So, uh, I think they'll come out on their own. Uh, this is Paul. I did a terrible job of introducing him last time, sorry. Paul's been in a couple of other videos. You'll probably remember him from such cinematic greats as uh, anchoring a small boat and mounting an outboard or whatever. Um, so he's going to be my hands for today. Thank you, Paul. You are welcome. Oh. Here's today's little disaster. Australian trees, particularly black butts, shocker for dropping branches. Went through and it only broke one rafter. None of the structures moved. Oh, that rafter's. You can see the bird's mouth on that rafter's lifted up. There we go, a little bit of stick along the top just to hold it in place. That way I can sort of finish it when Paul's not here. I'm gonna get a little bottle jack. I'm gonna push the bottle jack against here, bring the bottom in, and then weld it out during the week. Nice. Now we can pivot off that. Oh, Maybe get the far side one. So this is the clearance we need. See how this comes up and ends up inside the diameter of the drum. I am tempted to actually cut it right off and then I can cut the top off in the workshop, all that kind of thing. We're going to take the winch off the bulkhead again so we can weld round. We're pretty happy with where it is. And it'll let us get the needle gun in here and we'll get rid of all this rust. No assistant today, so I'm going to have a go at cutting it myself. Um, I think it'll be fine. It's still sore, can't bend it much, but it's been a month, so, you know, give it a whirl. So I'll weld it on first, then we'll put primer on it. Otherwise, it's just going to burn off again. With the post off, obviously I couldn't easily put it back on the mooring, so big thanks to Dave for letting me put it on his uh, wharf overnight. Interestingly, you can see a couple of tinnies there. Renko's about twice the length of your average tinny, nine metres compared to, say, a 4.5 metre tinny, so it gives you an idea how small it really is as a boat. Ed, are you ready? Get your tail out of the water, Ed. Yeah. <laughs> sort yourself out. Huh? Eddie, turn around. <laughs> Can't face backwards. All right, little post. Don't fall off until I get back. You're not going to let me get away, are you? Stop ignoring me. All right, hang on. Let's get you some seed then. <laughs> Come on, Shadow. <laughs> you are hungry this morning. How's Daisy doing? Oh, yeah. Here she comes. <laughs> there you go, eat some seed. Share it with Daisy. <laughs> Don't make a mess here. Have it down here if you're gonna do that. There you go. You're going the wrong way, Daisy. You're going the wrong way. 
do make me laugh. Adrian's here at the moment, squeezed into the engine bay. <laughs> Adrian. And uh, we're just trying to figure out whether maybe we've got too much oil in the sump here. There's a lot of oil around the liner. It's quite wet around the liner. Okay. Shouldn't be. Shouldn't be. Look at a little bit, but not. Mm. It's more of a dry, dry, oily mist. Right. Yep. Okay. Well, that one's been firing down beside the piston. See that? See the soot? Yeah. Right. On the outside. Yeah. See that soot? No. Right oh yeah. Yeah. Right. No, it's stuck. Well, it's something not right. That piston there looks, it's not too oily around the sides of it. Oh, yeah, right. Okay, it's mm. very different, isn't it? Yeah, that one's, which is what, what I would be looking for. You know, yeah, engine with 20 hours on yeah, it. Yeah. So sadly, the 471 had to come out again, this time heading up to Adrian's shop. Adrian did his apprenticeship on Detroit Diesel, knows them inside out. So although it was sort of a hassle to be taking out again, it was nice to know it was going up to someone who was an expert in these particular motors. So the engine's currently done 125 hours, so it's due for a service anyway, so I thought I may as well drive it up to him. Kind of reminded me of the old dad joke about the guy at the lights and he looks over and sees one of those turf trucks with all the rolls of lawn on the truck. And he says to his mate, he goes, that's what I'm going to do when I'm rich. He goes, what's that? He goes, send my lawn off to be mowed. Kind of how I felt, you know, driving the Detroit up for a service. Anyway, it's there now, and I'm heading up on Wednesday to start working on it with him. Anyway, trip went well, got it up there. It was really nice just knowing now it's there at Adrian's, you know, place. Just need to grab some tools, drive up there and know that by the time it comes back, it's going to be 100%. You can go back in this boat and I'm going to have 100% confidence in it. So that's kind of great. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. So the cam's pretty, got some gnarly marks in it. Yeah, the, which the rollers, yeah. It's not nice, but when I look down from the side here, there's a huge gap. I can fit my little screwdriver just about in. Okay. See the gap there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. These should only have 5,000 clearance. Wow. Should, should we only need to rock, rock this rocker 5,000? So somewhat what will be causing excessive wear, it'll be running on the camshaft doing that the whole time. Oh, okay. That's That there is just ridiculous, the amount of yeah, gotcha. So the cam's constantly trying to... Trying to... Well, it'll just twist going it around, and twisting and going around. It'll be scuffing the cam up, causing the excessive wear on the loads. Okay, so you can see there's a dark line starting to appear where they're starting to... The rings are starting to stick. Okay. They're starting to fire down the yeah. hole. Yeah. Sits across there like that and then wind him over. Just... <laughs> yeah. There we go. Like magic. Lifting him up. You'll feel them usually grab the side of the block. Like yeah, if it has caught, yeah. Uh, especially but in the 92s and the 53s, very critical that that bolt doesn't hang through because there's actually O-rings around the liner. So you'll actually smash uh, the liner, the, right. liner where the o ring gleams. There we go. What a what? It's a score, isn't it? What the? Oh dear. It's, it's been pushed in, is it? It's I don't know. These are the ones you pressure test, aren't they? they oh, to... they've center punched the caps. <sighs> What's that to do to... To retain the cap. They've locked it. Which is probably, when they've done that, created a void so there'll be now, it won't, it won't be sealing. Yeah, right. So you reckon that's where most of our oil's coming from? Yep. So this punch has been done. Center punch, yeah. That's and that's push, and this is why this is, is that contacting? Well, I'd say at some point it's been contacting, they've cleaned it back so it doesn't. Right, both, okay. Both spots above where the center punch is. Ah, right, so wherever it's been center punched, just blowing it out a bit and it's... Yep. Well, if we just get a couple in, I'll just give you a couple and then I can get on with yep. that for you. 
to help marinize this engine a bit more, Adrian sourced a deep-bellied cast uh, sump pan and made up a deeper pickup for it to go down to the bottom of it, which will help it keep in oil when the boat's rocking and rolling at sea. There's a new pickup right in the bottom of the pan. There's quite a belly to the cover that goes on here, so it should still pick up oil nicely. It's not too close to the bottom and sucking on or anything like that. So yeah, all right, so we're going to go for 1470. Okay. Get them right up there. We could go higher if we wanted to. But once again, this is something we could adjust after Later on, yeah, like we see what it does. Yeah. And it, it'll, you'll fit, you'll, so here it's a little, probably a little bit, wants to jump to life a little bit easier too when okay. it's burning up a bit higher. So yeah, okay, it's a little bit more crisp. Like a little platform, yeah, a little step on it, yeah. On it. yeah. So yeah, so 15 will slide in nice, 17 shouldn't go. So it should just, Mm -hmm. Nice and sl nice bit of, nearly no, dra not no drag, but it's a slight amount of drag and then it should stop mm -hmm. on the 17. So that's, gives you a good 16th hour really at the end of the day. If you were to grab a 16th hour feeler gauge, it should feel really nice. Okay. So that's, so that's timing tool. Mm -hmm. Goes in the little hole beside the injector. Oh yeah. So you'll actually see the oil. Push out. Push out, make sure there's no oil left in there. So we've had all these off and apart, so mm -hmm. they're actually it's sitting higher than one four seven. Yeah, one four seven. No, that's quite high. We'll get that. Squirt a little bit of water just on the seal of the Jabsco, you reckon? Or? Yeah, I think we'll do, when, when it starts running, I'll hang the hose. Might just poke the hose in yep. there, so it's sort of splashing around. Just dribbles around, around it. Yep. Oh, bad first effort. Oh, oh yeah. Anyway. Thank you, mate. That's all right, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. All right. That'll do. Yeah. Yeah, no ice cream. No, no ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. With the Detroit 471 reconditioned by Adrian and back in the boat, it was time to head off to quite a nice uh, send off from a few of the local musicians. Before we got too far up the coast, Adrian met us in Newcastle and helped me install the Raymarine autopilot. We drove up to Newcastle on the wheel, which was fine, but we've got a long way to go and it was so much better having this autopilot installed. Made life much easier and safer. After replenishing our supply of exploding dinosaurs, we headed all the way up the coast towards Bundaberg, where Damien and Jess from Project Brewpeg are. We headed there to do some work on the boat, but before we pulled it out, Damien gave me a hand aligning the Raymarine radar. So also if I go to him now, yeah. do a context menu, do more, you can say track with camera, and the right. camera will point straight at him the whole time, it's pretty cool, yeah. it's pretty cool. Right, so that's the name of the boat, Kibble Bay. Yeah. Right, so, so basically it's the camera pointing, as we go past it, the camera should continue to track it. So it's pulling out AIS data as well. Yep, so it's AIS plus infrared plus radar. Wow, that's amazing. It's pretty cool, isn't that it? That is really cool. Yeah. Yeah, I reckon that's actually a night, a really nice night vision mode is yeah. camera, infrared camera and radar together. 750 feet, you'd never think they were 750 feet. I would have thought they'd be like 300, 200. Yeah, right. So we can also go to this and then uh, bring our range down a little bit. Yeah. Right, so the camera's spinning around catching it. See the exhaust yeah, on it too? that's awesome. Yeah, so the camera will just track it constantly. To check the bearing alignment of the radar, I changed to a chart view, then zoomed right in and added a layer that superimposed the radar over the top of the chart. Okay, so now we've got both of them, and we are aiming pretty much at the starboard one, aren't we? Yep, you happy with that one? Yep. And so let's have a look. It's a little... So, yep. So when I look down the centre of the boat through here, yep our heading line was right through the radar target. Right. So we know that the radar's not 
it's perfectly aligned to the boat's heading. Right on. And I think it's really just compensating for if you installed it on its bracket, just not straight. Yeah, right. That's really what it comes down to. With the alignment confirmed, we took a moment just to relax and enjoy the sunshine for a change. Yeah, all right. We're going to the time, mate. Yeah, yeah, there's definitely a bit of... Oh, we've got a bit of one going yeah. now. No, nah, she's right. Go. A bit of waves here, it's not no one. <laughs> I'm going to use the seat roof. I mean, that's how you do it. That is pretty good. That is pretty good. <laughs> I like four strokes. They're just quieter. Two strokes are better. Say that. Time for a trick shot. How many nautical miles? Nobody ah, expected. Oh, that was disappointing. How many nautical miles have you done in your Cummins? That's not really important. I didn't even touch it. When I got to <laughs> last full standing. <laughs> trick shot off the buffer here into there. All right. <laughs> or that one. <laughs> oh, he <laughs> <I> parked it. <laughs> why is why is pull easier on a boat than on land? It's more fun on a boat. Yeah, it is more fun on a boat. You don't even need alcohol to be an awesome player. That's it. Three, two, one. Down. Go. <laughs> Once we were on the stand in Bundaberg next to Brewpeg, it was time to start replacing all the rusty steel in Renko. So this is as uh, open as it's going to be. Going back together from now on. Tamien's here, going to give me a hand. We'll just uh, get this longitudinal tacked in and then I can sort of fiddle doing the ribs tomorrow. All right. Yeah, good here. Gonna weld it out quickly before the sun sets. Cut the second plate now. Not quite the same fitment I had on the first one. Kind of we geniuses, but definitely enough to do a bit of a stitch weld and build it up. And then by the time we do a double continuous weld, watertight. Where I want to join these two plates, the sponson here, this one's low, this one's high. So it's worth putting the dog on here, the wedge here, because you're kind of getting them to do this, which should bring them both into an equilibrium. Tack it out and we'll be good to go. You can hopefully see there, it's brought them level with each other, but we brought this one down a bit, this one up a little bit, tack that, and then we're in good shape. Next up, we cut out the hatch between the cabin and the engine bay. Adam cut with the plasma cutter on the cabin side, and I caught all the sparks and slag using a metal fire bucket on the engine bay side. All right, there is the hatch plasma cut out. All right, there's the funnel. No door aid box to separate water yet. May add something that comes across, put the funnel on top. This actually has a mounting flange to go on a surface. So the door aid box could have air coming at the front, air down, but it'll do for now. I can always put a cover over it, spin it backwards. It's got a little locking screw like that. So plenty of options for keeping the water out. It's gonna be nice to have a little bit of direct fresh air down below. It's under the awning, so it won't get rain down at least. Put the hatch down to the cabin. It's just at your feet when you're at the wheel. I always keep it closed at sea, so A, no one falls down there, and B, you do tend to sort of stand here. It's a very narrow wheelhouse, so you sort of look out, have one foot on it, one foot off. Being stainless, it is a little bit slippery when it's wet, so if it's wet outside and you walk in with wet feet. So I'm just going to quickly put some uh, non-slip tape on it, and then we'll open it up and head down. Put pretty much the whole roll of tape on the hatch. That'll do for now. One day I may sandblast it and paint it with some sort of textured paint instead. But, cabin's below, a little ladder down. The shelves we did a week or so ago. Put new timber around here. Have the hatch in with new glass. And my lovely mood lighting on the Detroit. The last big job before painting was to fabricate and install some new handrails and some new larger cleats on the bulwarks.
you can see how thick it is when you pull the stirrer out. The drips don't even find a level again. They just sit on the surface. Hopefully the sugarcane burn off doesn't send any ash this way. Sometimes bits of black ash fall when they do these burn offs because I'm about to paint. It's not a good combination. Time to put the dark gray on. No more blue. The time then came to lift the engine hatch and the drawers up onto the deck so we could put the tabletop in place. We're on the go your way, we're on the work down. I'm gonna let the thing down slightly. Oh uh, yeah. Oh yeah, just be careful. Yeah. yeah, I just need to get a little bit of room on there. Yeah. Hey, hey, Good. Good. If we get that clear, we can you know, just lay it down onto the with the set weight. Yeah. Can you get it off that edge? Yeah. There you go. Oh. Yeah. There you go. With the last round of restorations complete, all the new paint on, dry, new antifoul, it was time to launch again and head north up to the reef and finally enjoy the fruits of all this hard labour. Well, here it is. Pretty finished. Well, as finished as boats ever are, but nice to see it all painted up and floating in some beautiful clear water finally. Got my second antenna up too. You can see here how much more clearly you can see the shallow sections of reef when the sun's high overhead. They really stick out quite clearly. It was also very nice to have the ladder to get up and down. That was uh, definitely a worthwhile addition. Doing the metal detecting here wasn't particularly about finding things of any historical value or monetary value, but it was a good chance to sort of test mucking around with some of the techniques and some of the gear. This is the inside of the old front-loading washing machine that I kept on board for pretty much this purpose. Last sunset on Lady Musgrove, off in the morning, into Gladstone to get uh, water and food. Well, thanks for watching. 
Sorry it's been a long time since I've done a video um, of now working back in IT uh, for a large part of the week and uh, obviously getting home, all sorts of other stuff happening as well. Uh, do appreciate everyone's support though during this project. I would probably say it's more of a cautionary tale than a video designed to inspire because if I'm honest it would be much better off just to buy a boat. <laughs> it doesn't provide videos and entertainment but uh, financially speaking um, you know doing a boat like this you end up with a boat that's not worth anywhere near as much as you put into it. That's been my experience. I think you're much better off buying a boat that's in much better condition to begin with. Uh, I've got a video on my sort of 10 tips of things I learnt doing this project so I'll put a link to that video as well. But I think number one really is don't buy a cheap boat and then spend money on it. Save your money and buy a boat that is in reasonably good condition. And I know that sounds like a bit of a cop out, but there's good reason for it. Uh, if I sold Renko today, for example, I wouldn't be able to sell it for as much as I still even owe on it, you know, let alone the money I've put into it and the two years I've put into it. So financially, it makes no sense whatsoever. If you then were the person to buy that boat, you would get a great deal. So what I'm saying is don't be me, be that guy who buys the boat from me who's already put the money in and knows you can't get that money back. If you look around, you will find some good boats like that. I think if you start from scratch, like I did with Renko, like a boat in really bad condition, I think you're better off building. All right, well take care and I'll catch you soon. You're all here. Don't eat out of the packet on the floor. There you go, Daisy. There you go. Oh, Daisy, you're useless. Why have you started making that noise, Daffy?